Brother Glenn, as he shares, give him a clear mind, give him boldness, remove distractions that he could share freely what you've laid on his heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Greetings again in the precious name of Jesus. Good to be together, and it's good to open the truth again and look into it. The Bible says in Romans 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Is that true? Do you believe it? Is it true of you? Have you sinned? I trust that's not a complicated question or difficult for you to answer. You understand that it's true of you. But have you ever stopped to think about how many sins you're guilty of? What would that number be? How many sinful acts? How many evil thoughts? How many sinful words? I know for me it would be a long list. So what can we do? Well, in Matthew 6 and verse 12 in the Lord's Prayer, we very simply pray and forgive us our debts. Forgive us our debts. Forgive is to stop feeling resentment towards, to stop requiring payment. It means to pardon, to overlook the offense and treat the offender as not guilty. Wow. What a concept. You ever stop to reflect on what that means? We're asking God, a perfect, holy, eternal, righteous person, to overlook our sins. To not hold us responsible for all the things that we have done against him. The Bible says in Psalms 103.12, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Isaiah 43, 25, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake, and will not remember thy sins. In Isaiah 1, 18, it says, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. God's saying, let's bargain together here. You bring me your ugly, scarlet sins, and I'll give you white, perfect holiness. I'll forgive you. Now, that doesn't seem like a very reasonable exchange to me. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18. Jesus tells a story here, beginning in verse 23. <clears throat> Matthew eighteen twenty-three. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, or count, reconcile his records, one was brought unto him who owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife, and children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and loosed him, and forgave him the debt." Now this debt here that this man owed, it says he owed him 10,000 talents. Now, 
That could mean a number of things in the scriptures, but one of the things it meant in the ta- time of the scriptures is a talent was 75 pounds. There were silver talents and there were gold talents, and we don't know what these talents were. If they were gold talents, it would be a debt of approximately $20 billion in our day in this time. $20 billion. Now that's a really big number and a little hard to comprehend. Just for a little perspective... That would mean that you would need to raise, have raised, have earned, have saved from the day the world was created, when Adam was born, created, $3 million every year till today. Then you'd have about $20 billion. Now how many sheep would Adam have had to sell to his wife to get $3 million? You're getting the picture. The point of this story is the talent's debt, this amount that he owed, was an inorbit amount of money. There was no way this man could have physically racked up this kind of debt. Jesus is telling us or teaching us about something else. And I hope you can see the comparison. He's talking about our debt of sin. That's what he's describing. I don't know how many sins you would be able to name that you're guilty of. But I promise you it's a way bigger debt than you've ever even comprehended. And this servant in the story comes to the king. And the king is looking at the the record and he's saying, You owe all this money and I've waited long enough and it's time we get some payment. So I'm going to sell you, I'm going to sell your wife and I'm going to sell your children, whatever you have. And at least I'm going to get something back. Maybe I'll get a talent. Out of these 10,000. Probably not even that. And then the servant bows down and worships him, it says. That that means more like he just fell and prostrated himself, begging for mercy. And he says, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Was that true? Remember I just told you it would take $3 million for 6,000 years to get to twenty billion this man was never going to repay this debt it was impossible and yet it says in the next verse such a powerful concept the lord was moved with compassion and forgave him the debt loosed him of the debt again that's an illustration of what god has done for our sins now if i would begin to write all the sins that i have ever committed on starting on this wall here behind me, as fine as I could print. This wall would be full. That wall would be full. Every wall in this building would be full. And I would only get started. And then there would be all the other sins that I have committed that I can't remember or don't think of or wasn't aware of when I committed them. And yet God's incredible gift of forgiveness is there available to us if we will take it. For me, sometimes it's almost such an unbelievable gift that it makes me a little skeptical. Have you ever felt that way? Turn back to Matthew chapter 9. Jesus was dealing with some people skeptical here of his ability to forgive. Chapter 9, verse 1. And he entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of a palsy. I don't know exactly what that means, but it says that he was lying on a bed. Some kind of paralysis is what he was dealing with here. And Jesus, seeing their face, said unto the sick of a palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. Well, of course. Why did they say that? Why were they immediately shocked by the words of Jesus that thy sins are forgiven thee? Well, they knew that only God can forgive sins. No one else is allowed to forgive sins. He is the only one able to forgive sins. Then it says in verse 4, And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think you evil in your hearts? Just like today, Jesus knows the thoughts of all men. For whether is easier to say thy sins be forgiven thee 
or to say to someone paralyzed that has never walked, to arise and walk. Which one of those is easier? Do you know any man that can do either one? It's exactly what Jesus is saying. Only God can forgive sins, but only God can make the paralyzed walk. And then this powerful verse, I love this verse. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. And said he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house. And he rose and departed to his house. And when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men or unto this man, Jesus. So Jesus says, he's going to get up and walk, so you know that I have the power to forgive sins. Jesus has the power to forgive sins. 2,000 years ago, when Jesus took his place on the cross as the sacrifice for all mankind to take away the sins of the world, he was making an unbelievable offer. Could one man really forgive the sins of the world? Really? Really? Every sin that's ever been committed by any human being that ever lived upon the face of this earth or will ever live on the face of this earth, that one sacrifice forgave sins. And you know, on the resurrection morning, had we known what was going on and had we been able to watch, we would have all been sitting on the edge of our seats watching that grave. You see, if Jesus is still in a tomb somewhere, then he's not my Savior, he's not your Savior, he's not anybody's Savior. But if God rose him from the dead, then it's the stamp of certification, approval, acceptance of that this sacrifice was good enough that it satisfied a holy God. And you know he rose. The grave couldn't hold him. It's the greatest exclamation mark in all of history. God's stamp of satisfaction on the sacrifice of Christ. This unbelievable offer is real. It's accessible to all. We can be guilty of the most horrendous crimes, and if we turn to Christ, he will forgive us because he has the authority to forgive sins. As unbelievable, as unfair, unreasonable, every other word you can use to describe it, it's still true. That Jesus Christ has the power to forgive your sins. Now, there is a condition on this forgiveness. It's not automatically applied to every person on the earth. Even though the power is there to forgive every sin, not every sin is forgiven. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know how extremely unfair this arrangement is? The requirement for me is simply that I would forget, for confess my sins, and God will forgive them. That isn't a very fair arrangement for him. And yet he gives it as a promise to all. Confess is to say what God says, that it's evil, that it's sinful, and I will turn from my sin. And he will forgive us. That's what the word of God says. Now, we are all guilty of sin. 100% guilty. We all deserve eternal death. But Christ has this incredible offer of forgiveness. And he has the authority to make that offer, as we just read there in Matthew chapter 9. We can experience forgiveness by confession or by repentance. Freedom is ours for the choosing. It's that simple. And that's the title of the message this evening, Choosing Freedom. God asked the question in Ezekiel 18 that we read last night, Why will ye die? Choose repentance and live. And, you know, when you think of how incredibly amazing this offer is, it's hard for me to fathom that there are still people, people that grew up in church pews listening to the gospel preached for their whole lives that reject this offer of salvation. Say, I'm going to keep my sin and I'm going to take that into eternity rather than surrender my will to the Lordship of Christ. That is just hard for me to fathom why anyone would do that. 
The choice is yours. Will you choose freedom? Now, there's a second part to this story of forgiveness, and that's what I want to focus on for the message this evening. Jesus said in John 16, verse 33, These things have I spoken unto you, that ye may, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Turn to John 7, or sorry, Luke 17. So Jesus says in John 16 that in the world you're going to have tribulation. Here in chapter 17 of Luke, Jesus says in verse 1, It is impossible, but that offenses will come. Jesus says, just as true as he had the authority to forgive sins, that it's impossible, but that offenses will come. Wait a minute, I, I, this part of the agreement I don't like so much. What happened to the easy street for Christians gliding on through life and into eternity in the constant presence of God? What happened to that? It's not what the Bible tells us that we're going to experience. It's not what we're going to experience. We're going to experience offenses. Every one of us could relate a story of someone or something that has hurt us. Offenses come in many different kinds. Some are small and they should be insignificant to us. Others are major sins against us, like abuse that has been going on for years. And there can be many, many examples of this. But Jesus promises that those things are part of life and you're going to experience them. Before I go further in the message, though, I want you to see here what Jesus says next. But woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Jesus is not making a light situation out of someone violating another or of offense that you're causing to another person. That is a serious, serious thing. Jesus is saying it would be better if you had a millstone. These were massive stones that they used to grind grain, hanged about your neck and cast into the depths of the sea. Then that you would cause offense to someone. So there is extreme judgment on those who cause offense. It's not a light thing. It's not something that we should be okay with, just running around hurting people. No big deal. Jesus said offense is going to come. No, that's not what he's saying. So if you're here tonight and you're hurting some of these little ones, Jesus would have very, very serious and stern words for you. But he promises that these offenses will come. I want you to understand tonight, I'm not talking about bad weather or crop failure or the well breaking down or illness or an accident or... I'm not talking about things like that. Those happen in life too. That's not what we're talking about tonight. We're talking about things, situations, where you can legitimately lay the blame for your pain at the feet of another person. Another human being caused you this pain. That's what I'm talking about. And when these offenses come, what should we do? Well, we started in Matthew 6. I'd like you to turn back there with me. We talked about all the sin that we have committed. And we very simply say in verse 12 in the Lord's Prayer, and forgive us our debts. Then the next phrase is equally simple and yet unbelievable, as we forgive our debtors. As we forgive our debtors. In other words, what we're asking in that verse, what Jesus is teaching us to pray, is that we should expect forgiveness to the extent that we extend forgiveness to others. That's what he's saying. God, give me what I give in the same measure. That's what we're saying. Forgive me as I forgive others. And back in 
Matthew 18, where we read earlier the parable, the story that Jesus told. I'd like you to look at what that story, how Jesus started that story, or what brought about that story. In Matthew 18, verse 21, the reason Jesus told this story about forgiveness is because Peter asked him a question. Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? Do you know that at the time when this story happened, at the time when Jesus was walking the earth with his his disciples, the rabbis, the Jewish rabbis of that time, taught that you should forgive someone three times. They sin against you, forgive them once. They do it again, forgive them a second time. If they do it a third time, you need to still extend forgiveness. But if they did it a fourth time, that's it. They're not sorry. You don't need to forgive them. So Peter's in his mind thinking, well, I know Jesus' standard is higher than the Jewish rabbis, so how about we double it and we add one? That should be a good guess, don't you think? So he says to Jesus, in all sincerity, how often should I forgive my brother if he sins against me? Maybe something had just happened to Peter by one of his brothers. We don't know that. Seven times. And Jesus said, I say not unto thee until seven times but until 70 times 7. Now this, again, I don't know exactly if this is 77 or if this is 490, but I'm pretty confident that Jesus didn't mean keep counting. And once you get to 491, that's it. No more forgiveness. That's not what he's saying. We should continue to forgive. Back in Luke 17... When Jesus is telling these, the, what I just read there at the beginning of the chapter, he tells us these offenses are going to come. It's going to be horrible things, so horrible that the people that committed them against us, it would be better for them if their heads were tied onto a millstone and they were cast into the sea. Then he says, take heed to yourselves, verse 3, if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, and if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee, notice this, Seven times in a day, Luke 17, verse 4. Seven times in a day, and seven times in a day, turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. I'm staying at Eric's house this week, and I'm trying to imagine what it would be like if every morning, first thing in the morning, once we're both awake, I'd come down and I'd punch Eric in the face. And then I'd say, oh, sorry. And of course, he's a Christian, so he'd forgive me, right? I go back upstairs with my coffee, come back half hour later, and punch him in the face again. Sorry, Eric. I didn't mean to do that. Please forgive me. Seven times. You think he's still going to forgive me? That seems crazy. Seven times the same sin against me in one day, and Jesus, you're saying I'm still supposed to forgive him? That's pretty radical teaching. Look at what they say next, the apostles. Verse 5, the apostles said unto the Lord, increase our faith. I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, but forgiveness is a faith issue. Forgiveness is a faith issue. Do you believe that you can trust God with whatever has happened to you? Do you believe that you can turn over to God all responsibility to make this right? in his way, and in his time. Do you believe that? You must believe that if you're going to forgive. That's what it is. It's turning over. And it's a faith issue. And that's why his disciples say after say, hearing this seven times in one day teaching, they say, increase our faith. So what should we do when these offenses come? Clearly, we need to forgive. But what if we refuse? To forgive when an offense happens. What happens then? Some of the things that people do to other people are almost unimaginable. There is some horrific things done from one person to another. And I'm to believe that I must forgive? That's what I need to do? Well, that's what the Bible teaches, but what if I don't? What if it's just too hard for me? 
What if I don't, can't bring myself to forgive? The pain is too deep. It's too hard. It hurts too much. I cannot forgive what happens. Well, number one, we lose our salvation. I just said that out loud. What? Are you saying that if I don't forgive someone who has hurt me, that I lose my salvation? Is that what you're saying? No, it's not what I'm saying. It's what the Bible says. Go back with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. After Jesus taught them how to pray at the end of the prayer... He tacks on this explanation because he probably knew that this was going to be just a little bit too much for us as humans. In verse 14 of Matthew 6, he says very clearly, For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Is that hard to understand? If you forgive, God says, I'll forgive. If you don't forgive, I won't forgive. If you're not forgiven, are you saved? No. Now that's a really, really, really sobering thought. And it's pretty serious. So maybe we better make sure that it continues the same teaching in the other parts of the scripture. By the way, I looked at a lot of other translations just to make sure the King James didn't get it wrong here. It says the same thing in every translation, except ones that are really, really bad, like those paraphrase ones that don't even translate. They just kind of, whatever the translator's magical thoughts were at the moment when he looked at that. In Mark chapter 11, I want to show you some more scriptures because I'm fairly confident that there are some of you here that are struggling to forgive some who have hurt you. Mark 11, verse 25. Jesus says, When you stand praying, forgive. And if you have aught, or if you have anything against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. And again, I want to take you back to Matthew 18, to this story Jesus told. We only read the first half of the story. Matthew 18, beginning again now to read in verse 28. So right after this servant had been forgiven this $20 billion debt that he owed, that he could never repay, and the consequences of, of his debt were going to be that he would be sold and put into prison, and his wife was going to be sold, and all his children were going to be sold, but he begs for mercy, and God forgives him. And then this same servant, it says in verse 28, went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. Now let me just talk, stop here for a moment. A hundred pence was about a hundred days' wages, roughly. About a third of a year's wages. Or, I don't know what a third of a year's wages is here. Let's just say $20,000. Do you know that that's a million times less than the debt this man was just forgiven? A million times less. Nothing, I say this gently and I say it kindly, but nothing that we will face, nothing that we will ever be asked to forgive to another person compares to the debt that I have been forgiven from my Heavenly Father. Do you believe that? It's true. And I still say I'm not minimizing some of the horrendous things people do to each other. I'm not minimizing that. But do you have any sense of what you have been forgiven by a holy God? I think it's Martin Lloyd Jones that says, I, I can't remember his exact words, but he says, When I comprehend anything of what I have been be- forgiven by this holy God, then I am ready to forgive anyone anything. Let's read on. This servant, after he was forgiven this massive debt, 
is owed a small debt, a very small debt in comparison. And he laid hands on this servant and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down on his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Exact same thing the servant did before the king. But instead of forgiving him, you know, if this man had just forgiven, have you ever stopped to think about this? If he just forgave and accepted the forgiveness, he was still ahead 999 999,999 times he was still ahead, okay? Because he'd just been forgiven a $20 billion debt, and now he forgives a $20,000 debt. There's no comparison between those two things. But he would not, it says, and went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry. There was an injustice here that they couldn't overlook. And they came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, the king, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. When this servant left the king, in the story in verse 27, how much did he owe the king? Zero, right? A few verses later at the end of this chapter, how much did he owe the king? $20 $20 billion. Do you get the comparison? Do you see the picture? When we refuse to forgive, we remove the forgiveness that we have been given. That's what he's teaching us. So when we refuse to forgive, we lose our salvation. That's a very, very serious thing. That's death. That's eternal death. But friends... That's not all that happens. Number two, we lose the power of God in our lives. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. Looking diligently... Lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Did I give you a definition already this week for the grace of God? The grace of God, very simply, I don't see any of you nodding your heads, so maybe I didn't. The grace of God, very simply, is the power of God to do the will of God. That's what it is. And the grace of God comes to us as we connect in faith with God. We, we embrace what he has planned for our lives, and we walk in the light. You can read about that in James chapter 4. I don't have time to expand all of this concept to you tonight. But the grace of God is flowing into our hearts as we walk in obedience. Paul was told when he was struggling with his thorn in the flesh... He was told, I'm not going to take away the thorn of the flesh, but I'm going to tell you that my grace is sufficient for thee. Is there enough grace for you to live in victory to do what is right? And that's how it is for the Christian. Here in this verse, we have someone who is not able to come to that conclusion that God's grace is sufficient for them. It says here, lest any man fail of the grace of God. In other words, this person has concluded that the resources of God are not big enough for them to face the circumstances of their life. That's what he's saying. In light of what we're thinking of this evening, if someone has hurt them so badly that they can't forgive because God's resources for forgiveness are not big enough to forgive that person. And you know what it says here then? When you fail the grace of God... 
a root of bitterness is going to spring up and trouble you, thereby many be defiled. We'll come back to that bitterness thought in a moment. But when we fail to forgive, we lose the power of God in our lives. That grace is no longer able to flow because we have determined it's not sufficient for us. Now, we live in a world where there's a lot of victims. Have you ever heard that word? I'm, again, I'm not making light of hurt that is caused from one person to another. Jesus acknowledges that there are victims. That's part of what happens in life. The problem we have in our day especially, and I think it's worse than it maybe has ever been in the history of mankind, is that we have people who are then embracing a victim mentality where they are caught up in their victimhood and they are crippled for all of the rest of their life, many people. Now that is really hard to exactly define what happens when we take on that victimhood, victim mentality. We fail to overcome, and so our psyche depends on us coming up with some justification in our minds for why I cannot forgive that person, and why I'm a permanent victim of these circumstances. We have to have some justification in our mind, or we go crazy. And along comes Western psychology and counseling with a wonderful answer for you. You poor person. You've been hurt. You can never function normally. They don't say it quite like that, but essentially that's what they tell you. You're hurt. Everyone should treat you with kid gloves from now on. Now, this is not from a Christian author, but I found this interesting. Even the world is starting to recognize that this is not working. And I found a list of descriptions of what it is, what it's like, how a person thinks when they are a victim in a victim mentality, a permanent victim state. I want you to think very carefully about your own life, because as I mentioned, it's not just out there in the world. I meet many Christians today in our own churches who are floundering in their spiritual lives because they refuse to move from this place of being a victim. Here's some of the symptoms. You blame others for the way your life is. You truly think life is against you. You have trouble coping with problems in your life and feel powerless against them. You feel stuck in life and approach things with a negative attitude. You feel attacked when someone tries to offer helpful feedback. Feeling bad for yourself gives you relief or pleasure. You attract people who blame others and complain about their life. It's difficult for you to examine yourself and make changes. Again, that's a secular list of what it looks like when someone takes on a victim mentality. Listen carefully to these words. Choosing victimhood is to shut out the responsibility for my current struggle. That's what it does. And when we shut out responsibility, this is the real tragic part, we shut out the possibility of change. If I determine that I can't, there's nothing I can do here, it's true, there's nothing you can do here. And when we're victims, and we remain a victim, then we declare God's grace is not sufficient. And then what happens next? Number three, we, come, we become bitter people. And that's what it says at the end of this verse. A root of bitterness is going to spring up. It's going to trouble you. And it's going to defile many around you. Bitterness is a terrible thing. And again, bitterness can be hard to explain. But I came across this illustration. And I think it's a good one. Trying to maintain a, a victorious Christian life with bitterness inside your heart is a little like trying to hold a beach ball down in a swimming pool, climb up on top of it, 
Have you ever done that? Some of you older ones might have to think back a long time ago. You know, a beach ball, big round ball of air, you can kind of try to get up on top of it. You can try to balance there, and if nobody does anything, you maybe get it just right, and you can keep it on top. You can stay up there. But the minute there's the tiniest wave in your life or anything about your balance shifts, whoosh, there it goes. You lost it again. That's how it is when you have bitterness in your life. If all of your circumstances are perfect, then you can function somewhat normally. But the minute there's a first sign of trouble or the first thing goes wrong in your life, the sky is falling. Friends, as automatic as exhale comes after inhale, so automatic comes bitterness after unforgiveness. I can keep it in for a little while. It's going to come out. In December 9th of 1977, on a basketball court in Los Angeles, an event happened that has since and always been known as the punch. Two, men, two teams were playing basketball and a skirmish developed under the one net. Kermit Washington was on one team and got involved in this scuffle with one of Rudy Tomjanovich's teammates. Rudy was at the far end of the court and saw this scuffle and came running full tent tilt to get into the middle of it to try to break up this scuffle be to protect his teammate. Now Kermit Washington was a big man, a big, strong man. And as Rudy's approaching over his shoulder fast, he sees him out of the corner of, the eye, of his eye and he just turns like this with his fist and punches him right in the face. Rudy Tomjanovich went down on the floor and was convulsing on the floor. It broke his nose. It broke his jaw. He had brain damage. The doctor, as he was beginning to do reconstructive surgery to rebuild his face, told him that funny smell you taste in your mouth is brain fluid. Rudy never played professional basketball again. Coach basketball, but never played another game of professional basketball. In the prime of his career, Kermit Washington, in one foolish action, outside of the normal play of basketball, took away his career. Now, you know it's a different time, a different era, because a, a reporter asked Rudy if he can forgive Kermit Washington. No, no reporter would ever ask that question today. You know what Rudy said? Something very profound. He said, if I don't forgive him, it's like drinking poison and hoping someone else will die. It's like drinking poison and hoping someone else will die. If you're sitting here tonight and there's a person that you cannot forgive for what they did to you, that's what you're doing. Little by little, it's destroying your life. You suck it in, and you're hoping someone else is going to die. It's not going to work. What happens when we don't forgive? Number four, joy, peace, and healthy relationships are lost. I'm not going to spend much time here. It's obvious, but it is impossible to have a healthy relationship with a bitter person. I've talked to husbands that are married to a bitter wife. My wife has talked to wives that are married to a bitter husband. That's a bitter pill. You can't have a healthy relationship with that person. And if you know someone that is bitter and has this victim mentality complex, you are going to walk on eggshells in every interaction you have with them. You know what I'm talking about? You just can't say anything right. Every time you say something, the words are twisted out of context, and two weeks later you find out that they were offended by what you said. You can't have a healthy relationship with bitterness in your heart. And number five, people who can't forgive become depressed, delusional, hopeless, helpless, 
full of self-pity. They turn into spiritual vagabonds. I could give you a list of multiple people, and I won't do that, but that I have watched over the years move from one church to the next church to the next church because they're looking for the perfect church, and all the time the real problem is right in the mirror in front of them, but they can't see it because they won't deal with it. Proverbs 18, 19 gives us a a phenomenal picture of what this is like. It says, A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. It's easier to overcome a strong, walled city than it is to get someone to break down the walls that they've built up to protect them in that bitter state. And then the next phrase is just so profound to me. It says their contentions, their resentment, their whatever they feel are like the bars of a castle. You are a prisoner in a castle that you have built and no one else can let you out. Your contentions are holding you trapped in that place. And many good Christian people can try all they want to help you. And until you choose forgiveness, you're trapped. One more thing before we close tonight. I'd like you to turn with me to Matthew 27. If you're sitting here tonight and you've been through terrible trauma at the hands of someone else, you might be sitting here thinking, this is just impossible teaching. Does Jesus have any idea what he's talking about? I'd like to read you a few verses about the end of Jesus' life. Beginning in Matthew 27, verse 22. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just man, see ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Jesus is innocent. Jesus has the whole power of the universe at his word. And read what happens next. Then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus... You know what scourging is? You've heard a little teaching on how that was. They weren't allowed to kill the victim. That was about the only limiting factor in how they whipped. They scourged him and delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. Somewhere up to about 600 soldiers would have been gathered here into this common hall, this large open room, all gathered around Jesus. In verse 28, and they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had played it a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put on his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. I don't know if you've ever thought about this or noticed this, but already in those short few verses, Jesus has been stripped naked twice in front of 600 soldiers as they mocked him, spit upon him, 
beat him on the head with a reed, mocked his kingship, mocked who he was. And then, turn over to Luke chapter 23. And just pick up the story here. Luke 23, verse 33. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, punish them. Father, pour out your wrath upon them. Father, I can never forgive them. Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then it says, and they parted his raiment and cast lots. Again, I believe Jesus was naked as he was nailed to the cross and hung there to die. Does Jesus know about injustice? Does Jesus know about the cruelty of mankind? Does Jesus know about what it means to feel all the wickedness of all of the evil empire come against him? More than anyone could ever understand. And yet Jesus said, Father, forgive them. You know what Jesus was doing in that moment? Choosing freedom for every one of us. Choosing freedom for himself. My friends, tonight again, I'm not minimizing what has happened to you. But I can tell you in all the authority of the word of God that you will never experience freedom until you take the first step to forgive. Forgiveness doesn't mean that everything goes away about what happened to you. Forgiveness doesn't mean that you will forget everything that was done to you. Forgiveness doesn't mean that you're going to go for a picnic with the person who hurt you. It doesn't mean any of those things, and I don't have time to explain all of that. But what it does mean is what... Corey Tun Boom said a long time ago, you know those big bells in the church steeples years ago? They had this big bell up there, massive bell, and the rope on it. And you pull the rope, and nothing happens because you're not strong enough. You pull it again, and you start to get a little bit of momentum. Eventually, the bell starts ringing. If you keep pulling the rope just gently, it's going to ring, and it's going to ring, and it's going to ring. She said for her, who was tortured in a prison camp in the Jewish Holocaust, She said, forgiveness is like releasing that bell rope. You stop pulling on that pain, if you will. The bell's still going to keep ringing for a long time, friends. But you can begin to heal. And you can begin to move towards freedom. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this evening with overflowing gratefulness for what you have done for us. We don't deserve your forgiveness. We don't deserve the sacrifice that you've shed through your son's death on Calvary. We don't deserve what you promise us through forgiveness. Father, you You know how hard it is sometimes, the things that we face in life. And tonight I pray that you would help each of us to see that we also don't deserve the torment that comes from holding on to bitterness and unforgiveness. And Father, if there's someone here in this room tonight that has not been able to forgive, I pray that you will give them the courage to choose freedom through forgiveness tonight.